Okay, <clears throat> so we have time for questions. And there's already one question in the um, in this lab. I'm gonna read it. So Harvey Mudd from College, it's, is it true that all reads have to go to the leader so the followers can help with load? Uh, so in our current implementation of uh, Skidos, uh, all reads have to go to the leader so that uh, we can give linearizable reads. Um, but it is possible to extend Skidos uh, uh, and apply the ideas proposed by prior techniques, for example, forum reads, so that we can enable reads of the followers as well. For example, the prior technique of uh, applying forum reads to Paxos enables linearizable reads by checking if there are any outstanding operations that have not yet been executed. We can also apply the same trick to uh, Skidos. So by essentially checking if uh, in a majority of, in a quorum of nodes, if there are any outstanding operations in consensus log or durability log, we can choose whether or not to return the values of reads. I have to think more carefully about how we would extend skidos to support reads from followers, but that's at a high level how we would design the protocol. I hope that answers okay. the question. Uh, there is also a question coming uh, from Zoom, at least there was someone with a uh, hand, hand up. I don't know if uh, the person still wants to ask the question. Uh, please go ahead. It's uh, the hand's not up anymore. Okay, so um, so there's another question coming from, from Slack. Is it possible, so should Dong Sun, is it possible for two Nilex APIs issued by different clients, their return values might change if the order between the two is different? Say a delete K, might return an error if K does not exist. So whether create K happens before the lead or after can change the return value of the lead. In that case, since the ordering is not decided when they return, how do you decide the return value? Yeah, uh, uh, thank you for the question. That's an interesting question. So uh, to answer, uh, to summarize your question, so you're asking if a delete depends on whether or not a particular key exists, and depending yeah. on that, if it returns the error, would it be problematic if you order the operations uh, right, in a different right, right. way? Yeah. yeah. So uh, if uh, so, an operation uh, is determined in X if it does not return any execution result or execution uh, error. So if it externalizes the state of the uh, storage system in any way, we don't consider that operation in X. For example, the interface that you are saying that is delete that would return an error if the key does not exist, we wouldn't consider that. Uh, delete interface to be nil So we would uh, immediately order and execute such delete operation. So that said, uh, like there have there are uh, delete interfaces that do not return uh, whether uh, return an error if the key being deleted is absent. For example, that was the case with uh, rocks DB and level DB because it's uh, expensive to do a query before an update. So in these systems, you uh, upon a delete, you would just insert a tombstone saying that you're going to delete the record. And later in the background, uh, these systems would apply this delete. And if the operation is not there, then it would be an OAP. Like if the key is not there, it'd be an OAP. If the key is present, then it would delete the key, but it wouldn't return any error to the uh, end client that's interacting with the system. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, you answered my yeah. question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so we have uh, another panelist with his hand up, that would be Siyun. Jai. Um. Hello. Uh, hey, thank you for the presentation. It's a really good one. I like it. Um, so I have a really quick questions. So when you, for example, issue or issue a write, you, all of the, the write request is sent to all of the uh, followers as well as the leaders. So if the cluster scale is really large, is it going to be um, uh, limited by the client's memory bandwidth? Sorry, uh, the network bandwidth. Uh, that's a good question. So in a, you're right in that uh, in a protocol that uh, like uh, Paxos with the batching, you would just send the request to the leader, whereas in our yes. protocol, we need to send it to all the replicas. Specifically, we need acknowledgement from a super majority of replicas. But, yes, yes. Uh, I, 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 I suspect that the cluster size, like even if let's say you have a big storage system, you might have many uh, nodes in the storage system, but within a replica set, the number of replicas within a replica set might be limited. For example, typical deployments are uh, in the order of like five or seven or nine replicas. So in okay, those it. scenarios, it shouldn't be a problem. So 
Be because when you have like a large cluster of storage system nodes, then essentially you shard your data across these uh, nodes and then across these replica sets and each replica set size would be limited. So I don't believe that it should be a problem. Yeah, thank you. Okay, okay, got it. Thank you, thank you. Let's uh, take another question from his left. Uh, it's Brian Kim from Syracuse University. So it says, very interesting. Is there a possibility of something going wrong because the underlying storage is hiding or lying about its internal state because it doesn't have to sterilize? Uh, and then he also says, I think a similar comparison can be made to storage devices, perhaps. Storage devices buffered writes inside their own volatile cache and sent back acts. So new commands were added to flush cache data or forced writes to be persisted. Uh, so that cache is durable despite a sudden power outage. Do you think a similar series of events can happen at the distributed storage level? Uh, so if I understand correctly, uh, the question is, uh, are there any problems uh, that could arise because the underlying storage is lying about uh, executing the operation and that it's acknowledging the operation without even executing it. Uh, right. So uh, I believe that uh, if the interface itself is designed to be such a way, uh, in such a manner that the, uh, uh, the applications are fine with not knowing the effects of the operation immediately, then it shouldn't cause a problem. Uh, I can think of some cases where this could be problematic. For example, let's say you have buffered a write uh, to be applied. And then uh, when you're actually applying this write into the storage system, if there is a catastrophic memory or disk error, then it's possible that uh, you might not be able to notify the client of it. Whereas a system that is executing this operation in the synchronous path would be able to notify the end client of it. But uh, I think it's not a problem because we are talking the, uh, talking about this problem in the context of a replicated setting where you have inherent redundancy in the system. So in, if in, in case there is a catastrophic error that happens on one of the nodes, you could just treat that as like a crash failure and then crash the node and then proceed. So my hope is that it's unlikely that you would uh, run into the same problem on all the nodes. So uh, I hope that answers the first part of your question. Uh, I think you also have a second part of the question, which I, uh, I think- Oh, it's a, it, it was a long question. Perhaps you guys can get together after the presentation and discuss some more. I think he's raising some interesting yeah, points. Yeah, yeah, So sure. let, let's take one more. You, you were a bit late on, on your start. So there's Marius Kodjas from MSR in Imperial College. That's a very neat idea based on your experience with the new X uh, interfaces. Are new X pops usually followed by a no new X ones? So clients send a few new X operations and at some point they need to observe the storage state. Is there a pattern to observe there? And is that the case? How often does this happen? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So thank you for the question. So uh, we looked at uh, real world traces from uh, Twemcache, which is a Memcache DA clone at Twitter. And then we also looked at uh, traces from IBM cloud object storage. And uh, what we found is that first, uh, Nilex interfaces are more common. And uh, when we also analyzed how often uh, non-Nilex uh, operations immediately follow Nilex operations. For example, if you have a right to a Nilex right to a particular key, how often does a read immediately follow, follows that uh, particular write? And what we uh, found is that in most cases, uh, reads do not immediately access the items that you wrote. So you have enough time in, uh, to order and execute these operations in the background. So in unfortunate cases that reads do follow immediately, right? Then we can uh, take a slower path and then uh, order and execute them synchronously. But uh, what we have found from real world traces and also running uh, YCSV benchmarks is that uh, uh, the fast case in our protocol is the most common case. Okay, thank you so much. Thank I you. think, uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much for the presentation and for all the clarifications. Uh, we're you. gonna move on to the, to the next paper. I have a participant. Oh, I wanted to mention before I went to questions, that both Ashwadia and, and, and Ram, the first two authors of this paper are on the academic job market and are looking for tenure track positions this year. Um, so we have a question from Inho. Um, and would you like to ask your question? Uh, yeah, sure, thanks. Uh, uh, hello, Asharia, uh, I'm Inho from NUS. Yeah, uh, yeah thanks for the great talk. Uh, my question is, uh, it's very interesting that you use the nil next um, interface for the replication protocol and achieve the, the, such a significant performance advantage. So I, I'm curious if the Nilnext 
interface could be applied for the transactional system as well, like partition transactional system. And if we could achieve some, some performance advantage there as well. Yeah, uh, so thank you for the great question. So that's an interesting question. So you're talking about uh, applying this idea in the context of uh, transactions where you have multiple shards and you have like cross shard transactions, correct? Right, right. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, we have to think more carefully about like how the upper level protocols uh, that enables uh, due to, uh, asset guarantees uh, across shards uh, would interact with uh, the underlying replication protocol, the POs here. For example, like we have to think carefully about how the two-phase commit protocol would interact with uh, CROs. And I, I, I can't immediately think about um, whether uh, the uh, whether we can be uh, replicating those uh, operations uh, using uh, by exploiting externality or not. I can think about uh, maybe using the externality to replicate transactions within a shard, specifically if uh, like we can uh, treat each transaction as a state machine operation, and then uh, use our uh, NILX protocol to replicate those transactions, provided uh, the updates used within the transaction are all uh, NILX and the clients submit these uh, submit the transactions in one shard where it's uh, specifying all the updates it wants to perform as part of the transaction in one shard for the system. Uh, I would have to think more about how we would apply it in the context of uh, a sharded uh, multi-shard transactional uh, context. But thank you for the great question. That's something definitely uh, worth thinking about uh, as a potential avenue for future work. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, thanks. I think we have another question from Alan. I saw a hand raised. Uh, do you want to ask your question, Alan? Thanks very much. Uh, greetings from Australia, where I'm enjoying watching this. Um, my question is about the, the actual interface issue. As, as I understood it, the essential thing to be nilxed is that the response doesn't actually reveal what's happened. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that make programming the, the level above much harder? Because then you only discover the problem down the track and have to arrange either to recover the context where the problem happened. Um, so how do you deal with this or, or is that just something you accept? Yeah, uh, so thank you for the great question. So uh, one thing that I want to uh, make clear is that like we don't expect that applications would be only using LX interfaces. So, uh, our protocol supports uh, both NILX and non nilx interface. So we expect that applications, then they want to know the result of an operation immediately. Uh, for example, like if you if you are using uh, the uh, interface in the context of uh, synchronization, then we could use a non nilx uh, uh, We could make that a non nilx interface, and then uh, we could take these two path in our protocol. Uh, to answer your specific question about like our applications okay with uh, such NILX interfaces, we see evidence from uh, many uh, key value stores that we looked at that, uh, for example, if the, the put interface in the key value store API is NILX, then because it does not externalize the effect of the operation or it does not reset any, uh, return any error immediately, and applications are fine with uh, using such, a, such an interface. And we thank also you. find that, yeah, thank you. We also find that when there are a lot of uh, NILX and non-NILX interfaces in a particular system, applications tend to use NILX interfaces more common. Thank you. Let's see. Um, we have a question in the chat thread that's related to this topic. Um, and the question is, uh, why are RMW, and I think that's read, modify, write operations, NILX, they usually return values to reveal some information about the storage. And so I guess I would interpret that as, as can you give examples of, of remodify writes that are nilxed? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, a read modify write uh, can be either a nilxed or a non nilxed, depending on whether or not the particular read modify write returns uh, 
uh, returns an execution error or an execution result. For example, to give an example uh, for a Nilex uh, read modifier, right? The uh, merge operator in RockTB that I talked about is a classic example for a Nilex read modifier, right? Because you spec you encode a read modifier, right, in the in in a merge operator and give it to the storage system, and the storage system would just accept that message, and this message would specify how do you want to modify that particular key value pair. But uh, the uh, read modifier right would not be applied immediately. It would be applied in the background later uh, during, especially in these systems that are that are background compaction processes happening, and it would happen during that process. And there are also uh, uh, non non elixed read modifier right interfaces. For example, if you want to do something like uh, atomic uh, test and set or a compare and swap, then you would want uh, non-LX interface because you are using this for synchronization and you would want to know whether or not your compare and swap or test and set succeeded. So in those cases, uh, when you're using uh, read modifier rights for synchronization, then you would want your read modifier right to return execution result or error. So that would be non lx Hope that answers the question. Thank you. I think it does. Thanks. Um, I don't want to pound on that topic too much, but I wanted to ask a different question, which is I, I really liked how the paper had this clever use of a supermajority. Um, but then when I read it, I was a little unsure how to evaluate the cost of doing an extra round trip versus the cost of using a supermajority. Because often the more nodes we contact, the more tail latency can come and get us, right? And, and often the, the P99, P999 latency is what I really care about. Um, so, so how would you help tell me to evaluate the trade-offs between those two things? Yeah, uh, so that's a great question. So, uh, so we, we actually, uh, in our paper, we increased the uh, number of uh, nodes and then uh, compared uh, our protocol with a two-round uh, protocol that uh, commits to a majority. And although we see increase in latencies, then compared to the two-round trip protocol, we still perform better. And we perform this experiment in the context of a single data center. Uh, so within a data center, we expect that uh, uh, it shouldn't be a lot of problem to go to additional nodes uh, in single round trip compared to going to a majority uh, nodes in two round trip, but this could be problematic uh, in geo-replicated settings where replicas are distributed across multiple data centers. Uh, especially, I could think of cases like if there are, if uh, a majority of replicas are close up to the clients uh, compared to a super majority of replicas, then the client those clients could commit to the majority quicker uh, in even in two round trip compared to. Uh, uh, committing to a super majority in one round trip. So in those cases, actually, even uh, the average latencies might be higher. So in those cases, maybe we could use some predictive techniques to predict that uh, committing to a majority is quick, uh, in even in two round trips is quicker than committing to a super majority. And then maybe uh, the clients could just mark those requests as non nilex and then commit them in two round trip uh, to a majority so that, uh, you know, you take the slow path in our system, which is actually the fast uh, path for the clients. Uh, I yeah, so that would be my answer. All right, thank you. Um, and I will point out that the chat thread's still open, and so if folks have further questions, feel free to post them to the chat thread, and I'm sure the authors would be happy to answer on the chat thread. Um, we're going to move on to the second paper in the session now, um, and Ing Dishan is going to uh, 